Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome. I am Zdeněk Hanzálek and you are watching the 34th talk of the scheduling seminar. Today, I'm happy to introduce Sigrid Knust. Uh, she is professor of combinatorial optimization in the Institute of Computer Science at the University of Osnabrück. She made her PhD in 99 with Peter Brooker, well-known scheduling researcher and author of interesting books. Uh, she's in fact part of a very interesting initiative, uh, which is classification of scheduling problems. Uh, it is a list of uh, different scheduling problems uh, where there are references to papers that have proven what is maximally solvable or minimal non-solvable in polynomial time. Uh, in fact, it was started by Jan Karel Enstra, which is today with us as well. And uh, then it was maintained by Peter Brooker and Sigrid and put on the web. And uh, nowadays, uh, every researcher can make use of it. Huh? There is another site like this, uh, which is maintained by Christoph Dürer, and this is Scheduling Zoo. So we have uh, nice, uh, nice classifications of uh, problems we deal with. I think it's quite unique in, in the research community. And it's quite good to find orientation in this uh, vast uh, area of research. Huh? Sigrid is interested in combinatorial optimization, scheduling, time tumbling, complexity problems, applications, and so on. By the way, she is playing in double bass uh, in Osnabrück Orchestra. So maybe next time she will play, but today she will speak. So Sigrid, please, the floor is yours and go ahead. Huh? Yeah, thank you, Senek, for the kind introduction. Welcome everybody to this talk. Of course, perhaps today is not the best date for a talk giving at that time due to the Soccer World Cup we are in conflict with. But yeah, nevertheless, I would like to talk about a scheduling problem, namely the synchronous flow shop scheduling problem, uh, which is some joint work with Stefan Walter, who did his PhD on this topic uh, some years ago and is now at the Technical University of Munich. Okay, here's the outline of my talk. I would like to start with a practical motivation, which comes from a production problem. Then I will talk you talk about yeah, synchronous flow shop problems in general, and some special aspects which also encountered from this practical problem, namely dominating machines, additional resources and setup times, and some further model extensions. Okay, let us start with a practical motivation. So we encountered this problem at a company which produces such kitchen elements. Namely, mainly they glue together these uh, wooden base plates and with this contour around. And they have a large variety of different products. Uh, and yeah, they have to be glued together. And this is the main part uh, they are interested in to do this in an, in an efficient way. So how is it done? Here's a view of such a production unit. So here you can see a round table with eight stations and eight workplaces around. So each workplace can be seen as a machine where some work has to be done on, on such a workpiece. So the process starts when a workpiece insert is inserted at workplace number one. And then it has to go around, so therefore flow shop, we will see later on around these eight workplaces, and finally it is removed. And what you can also see is that uh, this part is not alone on the, uh, on the machine, on the station, but uh, there are eight jobs in parallel processed, and then every job has to go around these eight uh, machines. When all products are finished, all jobs are finished on, on their workplace, then the machine, this production unit is rotated and uh, the next uh, cycle begins. And the, the last uh, job, uh, it's, the workpiece is removed here and a new workpiece is inserted here. So this is the main, main idea. Uh, and these doing it in parallel and this synchronization yeah, makes the problem interesting. In addition, there is a workpiece carrier. This is a kind of resource like a pallet. So it's inserted with a, with a workpiece and then this carrier goes around like a pallet with this job until, until the end of the production. So this is the main process. And yeah, at the company, we have seen it in, in this form that there are three parallel production units. 
Each one has these eight uh, rotating stations and eight fixed workplaces located around the units, which are, yeah, the insertion, I already talked about it. And there's a gluing robot, which does this gluing of these two, two parts. Then there's some drying and so on, some steps, and finally the removal. And here you can see at first here is station S1 here, and then it is uh, yeah, rotated. And afterwards, yeah, you see station S2 is here and the next uh, contour can be inserted. So as I already mentioned, there are very a large variety of different products. And mainly, yeah, for the company, they have two important stations, namely the insertion and the gluing robot. So that will be, I will talk about in the, in the section on dominant machine. So only the insertion and gluing times are relevant, all other times are more or less negligible. So then there are some customers of this company, they have some orders with associated products with a certain volume and a due date. And I already mentioned this limited resources. These are the gluing forms of different types. And of course, you can already guess, not every product can be processed on every gluing form. So we also have to make a decision which gluing form to use for which product. And this also yeah, makes it a little bit more complicated. They are not only limited, but if we change uh, gluing forms on, on this unit, on this production unit, then a change over time arises since the uh, people have to, to get it from the storage and to install it. So we have a yeah, more or less constant change over time if a gluing form has to be changed. And for the company, the goal was yeah, to find an optimal production schedule, which means that uh, there are yeah, two things to decide. On the one hand, we have to decide on which production unit each product is manufactured. Then we have to assign each product to a feasible gluing form. So this resource which goes around on this uh, table. And then of course, the scheduling aspect, we have to find sequences, production sequences for each of the three production units. And for the company, they had a, yeah, a objective function with three different components. At first, they wanted to minimize the number of late orders of the customers. In the second step, the total lateness. And finally, also to maximize the number of items produced in a, in a specified time frame. So we, we did some, some work for them at first and afterwards, yeah, we have looked at the problem more from a theoretical point of view, more in an abstract way. And this project was also funded then by the German Research Society. And in the following, I will yeah, talk more about these more general problems, not the problem of the company anymore, but this was a motivation for us where we encountered it. Okay, I think all of you know the classical flow shop problem and the classical permutation flow shop problem here. Only for the notation, we have M machines here in the sample five. We have N jobs here seven. Each jobs consists of M operations and they have to be sequenced in this order at first, the first, the second, and so on. And the operation OIJ has to be processed on the ICE machine for a certain amount of time units. Its objective is here in the permutation flow shop problem that we have to find one permutation for the jobs, which is the same on our machines, minimizing a given objective function, which is yeah, based on the completion times of the jobs. So here is the first job completed, the second, and so on. I think, yeah, everybody knows it. Now the same schedule in a synchronous flow shop environment, where we see it's a little bit different. Namely now the jobs are processed in synchronized cycles. So here these are the synchronized cycles. You can see the lines. And what is important that, yeah, they have to wait for each other. So there's the synchronous movement of the jobs to the next machines. So we see here, oh yeah, here perhaps is it interesting, one, two, three. And here job three has to wait since job one is still not finished on machine three. And then when all are finished, the next cycle starts and so on. So we see, yeah, the schedule becomes a little bit longer. I think you can see, especially here, you can see on the first machine, there are no idle times here. Also idle times occur on the first machine since jobs have to wait for other jobs on the other machines. 
And this makes it also very interesting that it's, yeah, the key issue is to find a good mix of jobs so that when they are processed together in a cycle that, yeah, uh, they have similar lengths so that we can avoid these, these, these waiting times for the jobs. And also here we are interested in minimizing a certain objective function. And again, we have completion times. And here perhaps it's interesting to note, yeah, we don't say that the job one is finished when it's finished here, but it's finished at the end of the cycle. Since we assume there's a, yeah, they have to be removed and uh, the, the, the table rotates and the, the cycle is only finished when the last job is finished. So these are the completion times of the jobs. Okay, so that's the problem we are interested in. Some related literature, I don't want to go into detail. There was some work before us also, yeah, coming from production problem, especially in, in cyclic assembly line balancing. Then some, yeah, branch and bound heuristics, some rotating production units with a similar motivation. And later on also, yeah, some works reconsidered synchronous flow shop problems. And also open shop with synchronization was, was considered later on. And I will talk mainly about these six papers, uh, which was written by, our, by ourselves, which deal with these different aspects. Okay, Stendek, you mentioned it, that I'm interested in complexity. So at first we also started with complexity issues. So, and here it's the same as in the classical situation, two machines easy, three machines hard. Namely, if we consider the two machine problem, Okay, I should explain the notation. So we use a well-known alpha, beta, gamma notation. And here in the second uh, field, we write synchronous movement yeah, to indicate that it's a synchronous flow shop. And it's easy to see that the synchronous flow shop with two machines is equivalent to the low weight flow shop with two machines. You can see it here. So here's a synchronous schedule. Here's a low weight schedule. Namely, if we are given a synchronous flow shop schedule, we can move the jobs on the first machine to the right. Then we have these no weight condition fulfilled. On the other hand, if we have no weight feasible schedule, we can move jobs to the left and have the synchronous movement schedule. So they are equivalent for the case of two machines. So we can apply the well-known algorithm of Gilmore-Gomery uh, for the no weight flow shock problem and get it polynomially solved. On the other hand, for three machines, this equivalence uh, no longer holds. However, the problem is also NP-hard. We could show it by a reduction from three partition. And for other objectives, like the sum of completion times or the maximum lateness, here we have yeah, reductions from the corresponding no eight flow shop problems with two machines. And they are yeah, strongly NP-hard for any fixed number of machines. Okay, now the second aspect uh, is the aspect of dominating machines. I already motivated it by the company by saying that only insertion and gluing are, are important. So what does it mean that we have a dominating machine? So uh, one machine, MK, dominates another machine if the minimal processing time of machine on machine K is at least at large as a maximal processing time of on machine L. So I think this is a, yeah, a concept which is also familiar in, in the scheduling community and a lot of research. We generalized it a little bit to say that a set of machines is dominating. So a set I of machines is dominating if the minimal processing time of the jobs on these machines is at least at large as the maximum processing time of the all jobs on the other machines. So here's a small example with three machines. Here I claim that the machines M1 and M3 together dominate the rest, namely machine two. So we check it. So the largest processing time on M2, so here in fact the processing times are constant, is, is this one. And we see the minimal processing time on M1 and M3 is at least at large as this. And this is, has some important uh, implications. Namely, this implies that in a synchronous flow shop, uh, these machines which are dominated uh, never are responsible for the cycle time. So remember these cycles, they are yeah, determined by a processing time on one machine. And we can see that only the dominant machines are important for these cycle times. 
So for the company, it means that only the insertion and the gluing time are important. So then we have two yeah, cases we consider on the non-dominating machines, namely, on the one hand, they make take arbitrary values. And on the other hand, that was also the case at the company, this value may, may be job independent. So if you remember that there's some, some drying process that does not depend on, on the job, it's, it's the same for, yeah, for all jobs, it only depends on the machines. So we also consider this special case where the processing times only depend on the machines. And we could show that this case uh, can even be simplified. It's equivalent to assuming that all processing times on the non-dominating machines are zero. So they can be neglected at all. Okay, this is one notation you should keep in mind. This means the processing time on the non-dominating machines are zero. Okay, here again, some complexity issues, starting with a single dominating machine. Again, here's a notation, I think it should be clear. I add something about the dominance also in the beta field. And we could see, yeah, that if you only have a single dominating machine, the problem is already strongly NP hard for make span and sum of completion times. However, yeah, for, for arbitrary processing times on, on the other machines, on the non-dominating machines. However, if we have zero processing times on the non-dominating machines, the problem becomes a little bit easier. Namely, now for the sum of completion times, this problem is polynomially solvable by the SPT rule. Yeah, it can be shown by an interchange argument. However, now you could say, okay, make span, uh, no, uh, maximum lateness, perhaps EDD rule. No, it's not as simple as it sounds. So EDD is not, not optimal. However, for the maximum lateness, the problem is still polynomially solvable, but with a larger complexity and it, so also the algorithm is a little bit more complicated. We always consider the feasibility problem and construct a schedule from back to front. However, yeah, here, if we go over to the weighted sum of completion times, yeah, we could not solve it. So Smith's rule is not optimal. And also Moore's algorithm for the number of late jobs does not generalize to this situation. So these are still open problems, even for two machines, we don't know the complexity status. However, these two polynomially solvable cases can be generalized to a fixed number of machines, mainly by trying out some, some subschedules and we get an additional factor n to the power of m minus one which means that it's polynomial f if m, the number of machines is fixed. Okay, going to the case of two dominating machines, it becomes even more complicated. Now the problem is also NP hard if the processing times on the non-dominating machines are zero. And also for the other objective function, it's strongly NP hard for yeah, each fixed number, at least two machines. Okay, perhaps if you remember my, my first picture of the company's uh, station, so I said the insertion is important and the gluing time is important. These stations are adjacent, which means that, yeah, I will denote it by this. So there are two machines, K and K plus one, and these are the two dominating machines. And in this case, if they are not separated by other non-dominating machines, this problem again is easy. Namely, then it's again a, a no weight flow shop with two machines. And yeah, perhaps if you remember the algorithm of Gilmore Gomery, it's it can be yeah, transferred to a TSP. So it's also sometimes called a large TSP in the literature, since the costs on the on the arcs are given by a maximum of two values. So each node has associated two values, AI and BI, and the costs going from node i to node j is given by the maximum of these two values. Yeah, and this yeah, is a special uh, cost structure and this special TSP can be solved in polynomial time by the algorithm of Gilmore-Gomery. And here you can see it again, the relation uh, from the synchronous flow shop to the uh, TSP. So here we see the cycles and we see the cycle time is always determined by the maximum of these two values. 
they are only yeah, differ by one index. We can see that this is a tour. So here we have the cost A1. Then for the next cycle, the, max, the next cycle, the maximum of these two values, and so on. So this means that we have to solve the corresponding TSP with these special arc costs. So if the adjacent, if the two dominating machines are not adjacent, then again, we don't know the complexity. Already for a three machine flow shop here, again, a similar picture. Here are the three machines. The second one is dominated. And what we could see is that now the schedule decomposes into two parts. So namely the even uh, positions and the odd positions, which means that yeah, job one, three, five, seven, or the positions in the, in the permutation, they are a one subschedule and the even positions are another subschedule where we can see the, the second machine is completely dropped from it and we have only the first and the, the third machine. However, yeah, we can also do the same trick as before. We can now formulate it as a vehicle routing problem with two vehicles. Again, these special arc costs and the condition that each route has to contain half of the nodes. That, of course, is not a typical constraint in vehicle routing, but it comes from the constraint that we have these two sub permutations and yeah, even and odd. And so it's, it's the same, same size if we assume that the, the number of jobs is, is even. But I, I'm not aware of any literature on vehicle routing problems with special R costs. So if somebody solves this vehicle routing problem, then perhaps also the three machine flow shop problem with two non-adjacent dominating machines could be solved. So that was part uh, dealing with complexity. Of course, yeah, the company was interested in solving the problem and also perhaps for the Maxpens criterion, it's interesting to have some algorithms. And here, yeah, we did some work on it with an arbitrary number of machines, two dominating machines, the positions are not relevant and assuming as in the case of the company, the processing times of the non-dominating machines are job independent. So you have already seen this construction one slide before, namely it's a vehicle routing, routing, vehicle routing problem with a certain number of vehicles. Here it was a problem with two vehicles. So it were two vehicles and the distance between these two machines, which are dominating was two. So three minus one is two. In general, it's the number of vehicles determined by the distance of the two dominating machines. And again, we have these special R costs. And again, we have this constraint that each tour has to contain yeah, the same number of nodes if n is divisible by this value kappa. Otherwise, we have to round up or round down depending on the n. Yeah, we tried out several MIP formulations based on formulations well known for the vehicle routing problem. And it turned out that this formulation was best, uh, namely, yeah, a two index formulation saying xij is equal to one if node j is visited directly after node i in some tour, but not specifying in which tour. So sometimes you also have a third index saying this vehicle is responsible for it. We also tried it, but it turned out with two indices was better. And of course, if you have TSP and vehicle routing problems, you have to deal with the sub to elimination constraints. So here, in addition, we had these variables ui, which gives the position of a node in its tour. And this could be used to also yeah, eliminate subtours. Okay, we did this MIP formulation and then also did some heuristic. And a very important property, which is also useful for, for every algorithm, is that if the partition of the jobs into the subsets for the tours is given, so if we have decided which job is done by which vehicle, then optimal sequences for each subset can be calculated again with a TSP, with a special arc cost, with this Gamora algorithm. So we don't have the sequencing problem anymore. So the partition into the tours is sufficient to have an optimal solution for the whole problem. So therefore it was, yeah, Convenient to have a solution representation exploiting this property. 
namely more or less <clears throat> we had a representation where we have some subsets, disjoint subsets corresponding to the vehicles. And then we did a taboo search with yeah, a simple swap neighborhood, uh, yeah, swap neighborhood in order to ensure that the number of nodes is not changed in the tours. Okay, here some small computational results. We did it with yeah, CPLEX at a time limit of 30 minutes. We had some instances with jobs between 20 and 100. And this difference between the two dominating machines, which determines the number of vehicles, ranges from two to five. And we used all instances for which we could, yeah, could be solved to optimality by the MIP formulation. And we could see that now our taboo search algorithm could solve all of the instances with yeah, two vehicles. Here it becomes a little bit less, which were exactly solved. However, the deviations from the optimal solutions were very, very small, and the runtimes were only a few seconds. So it seems to be a good approach, especially for the smaller instances. And for the larger instances with 400 to 900 jobs, okay, we again had a very small deviation now uh, comparing with the LP relaxation. However, the, the runtime increased. So we were in the range of minutes, nine on average, and up to 28 uh, in the maximum case. Okay, that was the stuff concerning dominating machines. Now I would like to continue with another aspect coming from the company, namely this gluing forms, additional resources, and the change over times for the change of them. So how can it be uh, formulated in a general way? So we are given a set of resources, renewable ones. Yeah, we can also say pellets, pellet resources corresponding to the gluing forms. And every job needs a single resource assigned from a feasible subset. So I already said, not every resource can be used by every job. And this is now the important issue. This resource is needed for the whole processing of the job. So it has it occupied from the first to the last machine. So let us again look at a small example here. I only have four machines, but I think the, the principle becomes clear. So now if a job is inserted, it starts on M1, then it goes to M2, M3, M4. We see it here, it's the first job. Here it has this pellet resource assigned. It's the same. So it means that then job one or station one is back at, the, at this place. Now a next job, so the fifth job is inserted. So a possible setup for the change of gluing time for a gluing form is yeah, between the first job and the fifth job. So usually you have setup times between two consecutive jobs on a machine, but here due to this yeah, large production unit and the fact that the resource is occupied during the whole processing, we have the setup a little bit yeah, uh, shifted to the right. So it means the setup is between job one and five, two and six, and so on. So the distance corresponds to the number of machines in the production unit. So what's the problem now? We are again interested in minimizing the total production time, which means, yeah, we have now the sum of all cycle times as before. And in addition, the sum of all setup times, which occur between these cycles when a resource has to be changed. Okay, for the resources, we also considered three different situations. So the most yeah, simple one is that all jobs can be processed by all resources. That means that these subsets for the jobs are the whole set. Then of course, no setups are necessary since each job can yeah, have its own resource under the assumption that we have enough resources. So it's easy to see a feasible solution exists if and only if the number of available resources is at least M, which means yeah, that we can use it during the whole process of a job. Okay, perhaps not so realistic. So at the company, we had more or less a second situation, namely that the jobs are partitioned into disjoint families. And in a family, each job can be processed by the same set of resources. So they are disjoint families and all jobs in the families, yeah, 
are exchangeable in the sense that they can be processed by the same resources. So in this case, we assume that we have setup times between the families. Okay, here we could show feasibility again, not a different problem can be checked in order of n. However, if we want to minimize the make span, this problem is already NP hard, even for two machines and for constant setup times. And yeah, the um, even more restricted situation that the sets are arbitrary subsets of the set of resources. Then, of course, this problem is also NP hard since this generalizes that one. However, feasibility can also can still be checked in polynomial time. However, with some more effort, namely we have to solve the network flow problem. In the following, I would like to focus on the situation with the two R two, which means that we have the families, and the company even has this constant setup times, which do not depend on the families, which makes the problem again a little bit easier. Okay, we decided to use some, some decomposition approaches. And the, yeah, the first problem to solve is how do we represent solutions? So here it's, I think, yeah, it could be done like this, namely a feasible schedule can be represented by a job permutation. So saying in which order are the jobs sequenced on the machines. And in addition, a corresponding resource sequence with, of the same length, which means that each yeah, resource in the sequence corresponds to the job at the same position, saying this resource is assigned to that job. So we have to take, take care that the jobs at the ice position is feasible for the job in the ice position of the permutation. And furthermore, we have to take care that no resource appears more than once in any M consecutive positions of this sequence, since, as I already explained, if here four machines, this resource is occupied for position one, two, three, four, and can only be used up from position five again. Okay, now we have these two parts of the solution. Decomposition means, okay, we decide about one of these first and try to solve the corresponding subproblem of the second stage later on. And now the problem is to decide in which order do we do this. Perhaps a more convenient way, or well, what we think it's perhaps easier, that at first we try to determine a job permutation, here trying to take into account the cycle times. Okay, you already see the cycle times are only determined by the job permutation. They are not, yeah, they don't affect it by the setup times. So this can be done in the first step. However, the bad news is again finding an optimal permutation, minimizing the sum of cycle times is a hard problem for three machines and more. Therefore, we did it heuristically. On the other hand, an advantage of this uh, decomposition approach is that in the second step, this can be done in, a, yeah, in polynomial time finding a feasible resource for every job, which is in this permutation, can be done in an yeah, optimal way, even optimal, minimizing the sum of setup times and also ensuring that a resource is not used before it can be used after these M positions. Okay, that was the idea. And then we did, okay, here, okay, also it can happen that this job permutation is infeasible. So no feasible resource assignment exists, then we go back to step one and modify the permutation. And then we did a local search, namely, yeah, we did a local search on the first stage, which means we change the permutation, mainly we swap two jobs, and then go back to the second stage, which is an easy problem. We can reassign resources for each of the jobs in the permutation. So that's the first decomposition approach. Here's a second approach, which is, yeah, the other way around. Perhaps looks at first a little bit strange, but we will see some advantages later on. So here's the idea is at first we determine a sequence of resources, again, ensuring that no resource appears more than once in M consecutive positions. And now, yeah, the resource sequence determines the sum of setup times. 
So in this stage, we try to minimize this objective value. And yeah, the nice thing here is that in the case of the company with the constant setup times, this is a bin packing problem, which is polynomial in N. So in the number of jobs, if we have a fixed number of machines, uh, which means yeah, that this is not too bad and this problem can even be solved yeah, exactly in the first stage. On the other hand, now in the second stage, we have to deal with a, with a sequencing problem of the jobs. So now we have to assign to each resource in the resource sequence a corresponding job, which may be processed by this resource. And now again, the, the partly, yeah, so the part of this second stage is to minimize the sum of cycle times. Okay, here again, bad news, finding a corresponding optimal permutation is again an NPR problem. So in this decomposition approach, we did the second stage heuristically. Okay, first stage exact, second heuristically, in decomposition approach one, first stage heuristically, second stage exact. And again, also here, we did a local search approach, which means we modify the resource sequence, we assign jobs and do it for a while. Okay, we tested it on the one hand on real world data from the company and also on yeah, these famous Taya instances for flowshop problems, which are instances with 20 jobs on five machines up to 500 jobs on 20 machines. In addition, we added some data concerning with the resources, some constant setup times and different characteristics characteristics uh, dealing with the number of job, job families, the availability of the resources, and the magnitude of the setup time. And here in the company instance, we see we even have 4,000 to 8,000 jobs and a large number of families. Yeah, but we did a time limit and what came out, I don't want to show you some tables, you can find them in the corresponding paper. Yeah, it came out that the second decomposition approach usually outperforms the first one. Only for some instances with a small setup time, the first one was better. Yeah, a possible explanation is that the second approach can deal with the setup times much better. Since I, I told you in the first stage, this bin packing problem could be solved exactly, especially minimizing the number of setup times. And this is a very key issue for, for the total objective. So if we can do this in a good way, then we get a much better solution than trying to perform with the jobs at first and doing the circle time minimization and then finding feasible resources. And we got a lot of setup times in the second stage. However, an advantage perhaps of the first decomposition approach may be that the first one may be easier to adapt for the more general situation if we have arbitrary subsets of resources. Then, of course, this <clears throat> second approach does not work anymore. And also, if we don't have constant setup times, uh, yeah, the, the, the approaches can be generalized, but perhaps they are not as efficient as they were in the case of constant setup times. Okay, finally, I would like to talk to, yeah, about two further model extensions, which were also motivated by the company. So the first one is one, yeah, which also was apparent in the literature with the cyclic assembly lines by Karabati. Namely, if we have a look at this situation, we see, yeah, here's a synchronous flow shop schedule with a schedule length of 19 time units. It could be a good idea, which is perhaps a little bit strange at first, yeah, to leave a machine idle instead of inserting a job. So this means we increase the number of cycles. So here we have uh, four, seven cycles. And here we have even eight cycles, which means that, yeah, here one machine is left idle and then the job later on, uh, yeah, we have more cycles. However, as we can see here, the schedule length decreases. So from 19 to 16, so this was an optimal schedule for the situation without leaving machines idle. This is, okay, another job permutation, but this is an optimal situation for the problem where we have the option to leave machines idle. 
yeah, so what is the advantage? So we can see here there was a large waiting time for job two and here a large waiting time of job three where the corresponding partner was missing on the other machine. And here the idea is if we can combine them, put them together that they are common in, in one cycle, then the, the schedule length can be, can be shortened. Okay, these leaving machines idle can be modeled by introducing dummy jobs in the sequence. So now here we have a sequence of five jobs, one, dummy, three, four, two. And yeah, of course we can also insert more jobs and that was yeah one of the first question when dealing with this problem: how many dummy jobs are needed, or is there yeah a, a, a bound where we can say okay, putting more idle jobs into the schedule is not helpful. So for this yeah let f of k be the optimal objective value among all schedules where exactly k dummy jobs are introduced. So the value zero corresponds to the normal problem where no idle jobs are introduced. The value infinity means that the number of dummy jobs is unlimited. And however, yeah, now there's something in between. So perhaps an optimal K value. So we were interested in the maximum value of K such that, yeah, this achieves the optimal situation also dealing with an unlimited number of jobs. But where if we have a smaller number, of dummy jobs, then the objective value is worse. So remember, this was the optimal objective value. So with k minus one dummy jobs, the optimal objective value is larger than with k jobs. And yeah, the largest value of k is interesting. So it's interesting to note that all these functions are monotone, non-increasing in k in the number of, of dummy jobs. Since in this situation, uh, we can always add additional dummy jobs at the end of the schedule without affecting the, the objective value. So it's really increasing. And so the question is, yeah, what is the largest value of K achieving an optimal situation? And what we could show is that, yeah, for any regular objective function, the upper bound is something like N minus one times M minus one. Namely, how can it be explained? Okay, uh, N minus one means that is a number of uh, intermediate steps between two jobs in the permutation. And M minus one is one machine yeah, less than we have number of machines. And yeah, what we could also see is here, you can see this is in principle the, yeah, the most, or the worst situation that every job is alone in its cycle. So it has no partners on the production unit and it goes alone. However, we can construct examples where yeah, this is helpful, especially if the due dates of the jobs are yeah, I like in this example, which means that each job has to be exactly finished at that time. So we cannot combine any job in, in some cycle with another one, which means yeah, we need so many dummy jobs. And for the objective maximum lateness and sum of completion times, we could also show that this bound is tied by having these examples. However, for the make skin, make spans criterion, this bound can be reduced a little bit, namely by, yeah, in the factor of the machines, we can have one machine less. Namely, yeah, here we can show it's again n minus one corresponding to the intermediate positions between two jobs. However, m minus two dummy jobs are sufficient. We don't need m minus one. And again, this bound is tight. So this is also interesting if we want to deal algorithmically with this problem. So it's it's good to know how many dummy jobs yeah, have to be introduced at the maximum. And, and we will also see later on that perhaps this maximum is not even helpful. Much smaller numbers are already sufficient for the number of dummy jobs. OK, so the next question is how much can we gain by introducing these dummy jobs by leaving machines idle? So we first did a theoretical analysis afterwards some computational results. I will show you the, the results shortly. So here for the objective of make spam, if we have K dummy jobs, we could show the relative improvement is bounded by, by this value. So by the number of dummy jobs and something of half of the machines. However, the absolute improvement may be arbitrary large. 
A similar situation for the sum of completion times, the relative improvement again bounded by some value. Here only this factor k plus one comes in. Absolute improvement again unbounded. And for the maximum lateness, both improvements relative and absolute improvements may be arbitrarily large. So if you look at this slide from a theoretical point of view, it looks yeah, very nice saying, okay, dummy jobs are a good idea. We can improve our solution very much. So it may be even go to infinity. However, it was also a question of the practitioner. Uh, is it a good idea to leave machines idle when doing this, this production process? And the answer, yeah, we will see on the next slide. We also did some computational experiments with yeah, some instances, some smaller instances, which could be solved to optimality by some MIP formulation. So we had MIP formulation for the situation without dummy jobs and a formulation for a situation with dummy jobs. Here we used an upper bound of four, which was, yeah, in most cases, was it sufficient? So a, a large discrepancy to the value I showed you before with n minus one times m minus one. Yeah, four was sufficient. And here's a number of jobs uh, up to 15. And also we used the Taya instances. I already explained them some minutes before. However, they could not be solved to optimality with the MIPS. So we used them, we solved them heuristically. And here are the results. So here's the first row for the first instances, the smaller ones, the second for the second. Here we see how many instances could be improved for the three objective functions. So we see among the 160 instances for the make spin criterion, only six could be improved. And this was optimally. So yeah, this is really a little bit disappointing for the other objectives, a little bit more, but also, yeah, most of the instances, there was no improvement. And if we see, yeah, the magnitude of the improvements, so here you see the average relative improvement in percentage. Here among all instances and in brackets only among the improved instances, we see that, yeah, this is also a little bit disappointing that these gains are rather small. And even in the case when we do it heuristically, okay, for the make spend, there were some improvements, but again, the improvements were very small. And for the maximum lateness, there was even no improvement at all. So here we see yeah, a large discrepancy between the theoretical results, which say, okay, large improvements are possible. However, if we do it in practice, it seems that it's not worth to do it in practice. And we also said to the practitioner, perhaps you can do it as you did it ever. Then we do not insert any idle jobs. Okay, now the final extension, we called it pliability which we encountered at another company in, in the furniture industry. Namely, yeah, so usually in, in, in shop scheduling, we assume that the processing times of all operations on all operations are fixed, they are given. However, here we assume that they are not fixed in advance, but that we are only given a total processing time for the whole job. And then, yeah, we can distribute somehow the, the, the job among the machines in a more flexible way. So the idea is now to determine these actual processing times instead of the given processing times, we have to determine them. We call them X, I, J. And they have to fulfill that the sum of them over all machines must be equal to the given processing times of the jobs. Okay, perhaps also, yeah, in practice, it may not be feasible to do it in an arbitrary way. So it may also be interesting to put some lower and upper bounds on these values. So we may assume that there is some part on a certain machine which has to be done on that machine. It's a lower bound. On the other hand, an upper bound saying it cannot be too much on that machine. Okay, here is a small example with three machines. So up to now, we would have given this table with this matrix of jobs and processing times on all machines. And here's the corresponding synchronous flow shop schedule achieving exactly these processing times. And here in the last column, you see the sum of all these individual operations processing times. 
So in our new instance for the pliability models, we are only given these values saying, okay, job one has to be processed for 19 units. However, here we assume that at least two units have to be spent on every machine. So, but instead of four, seven, eight, we could also do two, nine, eight, or two, seven, 10, but not one, 10, eight, since this goes beyond the lower bound. Yeah, and if we have a look at the schedule, we already see there are some improvements, namely, where are improvements? So have a look at job number one. So we see the cycle time yeah, of this first cycle is large. However, at this red part, job one is waiting for another job. So what we can do is to move these two time units from here to these idle times here. So we can see here, yeah, we did it, moving these two units to the third machine. And again, the lower bound of two is still satisfied. Another example here, job five, we can see also here, job five, uh, here's some, yeah, it determines the cycle length of the last two cycles. However, in the schedule, there are some idle periods. Yeah, here's some idle period where job five is waiting. So we can move some parts of these two jobs here, fill it up, and we see the schedule is short. So the motivation perhaps for a company is that, yeah, if some, some work, so, Assume it's, it's a flow line where something is produced. You have to visit every station. But in addition, there are some workers doing some assembly at this line. And then perhaps it's, it's not important whether the, the worker does it on that machine or on that. They can perhaps work, walk uh, besides this line and then also can use this time uh, when the job is on that machine. Okay, that was the idea of this, this models. Uh, try to reduce the make span by being more flexible and doing, yeah, the or balancing the machines somehow in a more appropriate way. Okay, again, some results. The problem, yeah, no surprise, is again NP hard, even for two machines and no bounds. Then we yeah, also had a look at the problem. Uh, you know this. Yeah, distinction perhaps from, from preemptive problems studied in scheduling. So if we allow preemption, then sometimes it's also decided or uh, distinguished whether we may interrupt a job at arbitrary times or only at integer times. And here we can do a similar thing. Namely, we can say, okay, the xij may be arbitrary real values or integers are required. And what we could show if we have only lower bounds, then there's no, no difference then always an optimal integer valued solution exists. And to solve these problems, again, yeah, we use the decomposition approach. In the first stage, we do a local search on, this, yeah, on the set of job permutations. And then again, in the second stage, we try to calculate yeah, optimal values uh, for the corresponding processing times. So for each permutation, try to find an optimal distribution of jobs to the machines. And what we could show is, yeah, the subproblem of the second stage is polynomially solvable as an LP if we are in the situation of arbitrary real values. If we have only lower bounds, of course, we could also use this LP, but we had a more efficient direct combinatorial algorithm. However, if integers are required, the problem is NP hard, and we did it heuristically. Okay, I think time to conclude. I have tried to show you yeah, something on synchronous flow shop problems motivated by a practical application in production planning of kitchen elements. And coming from this practical applications, yeah, we had some interesting features, namely the feature of dominating machines, of these additional job resources, these uh, gluing forms in correspondence with setup times. And then the yeah, two concepts of leaving machines idle, which of course in classical flow shop does not make any sense. And finally, the concept of pliability, distributing the processing time in a more flexible way. On the one hand, I showed you some complexity results, which are not only yeah, interesting for people interested in complexity, but also interesting and useful for efficient algorithms, especially if subcases are polynomially solvable 
been, can exploit it in our algorithms. And then I showed you yeah, some decomposition approaches which use these problem specific properties. For further research, perhaps these problems with open complexity, with a two machine case, with one dominating machine, weighted sum of completion time, number of late jobs would be interesting. If can, somebody can solve it, yeah, I would be interesting to see how it can be done. Yeah, that concludes my talk. I thank you for your attention. It's the slides, you can see the references. And then, yeah, I'm happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you, Sigrid. It was really uh, exhausting. And uh, now, if anybody has a question or wants to share his or her view on the problem, just go ahead. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, so, so, so if nobody starts, uh, could you please come back to this idea of idle jobs? I a little bit missed the. Uh, Miss yeah. the point why it helps and how is it possible that it helps? Sorry for that. Yeah, okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, that was the example. What is what is the definition of the idle job uh, already? So okay, that means that um, okay, so no job is inserted at the second pos. So we have the first round, uh -huh. uh, and in the second, usually a job is inserted at the first machine. I see. It's this inserting place, but now we leave the machine idle. Which means that the first job is can already ready transported to the third machine when it's finished on the second machine. Oh, I see. In this situation, it has to wait for the long drop on the first station, mm -hmm. and so therefore it's yeah it's it's not a good idea. I see. I see. Okay. So so this is the idea. But it's a little bit strange, and also the company perhaps yeah they never such did position it. empty uh, can help. Uh, really, I understand. Yeah. yeah, because then then two and three. In the uh, yeah, here this uh, was the advantage. Um, that okay. Here they are alone and increase the schedule length, and here combination of them is is, is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, if nobody asks, uh, I would like to ask him. Uh, one, one of the first slides you have mentioned relation to no weight uh, scheduling. Is it uh, com overlapping only in the case of two uh, machines, or uh, in the case of yes. several machines? Uh, I can see also some similarities. Uh. No, it's, uh, I think I mentioned it for two machines, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. I showed it to you. Yeah, here it was. However, for three machines, it does not work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with this movement. Because there are so, different, different like weights. Um, you know, so you have the no weight constraint between the first two machines and the second and third machine. And then it's, yeah, it's different from having it here. Mm -hmm. So a three machine flow shop schedule is worse in comparison to a three machine synchronous movement schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I think that San Jaeger has a question. Uh, if he doesn't want to go, then I go. Yes, Sven, please go ahead. Huh? Okay, so um, in the setup time setting, I think I understood it that the setup time happens between the cycle times so have you also considered the case that you can um do the setup in the idle time on the last machine for example so like uh, ah, here you mean that yes uh yeah no we did not <coughs> since again the company says the cycle has to be finished the job is still on this on this uh workpiece carrier it has to be moved out and then they can uh put on the next uh resource Okay, thank you. So here it's still not rotated, so it's still not at the right place. Okay, yeah, in practice it could help a little bit, but in principle, yeah. Mm. It's still a setup time. Oh, oh, okay, let me ask a question. Have you looked at any greedy heuristics and their worst case analysis? Because in flow shops, mm -hmm. there have been heuristics like the slope heuristic or yeah. the uh, profile fitting heuristic. And then maybe just like with the nearest neighbor heuristic of, uh, of the traveling salesman, could it, would it be possible? It's probably, it's not easy. Would it be possible to come up with a worst case analysis of such a heuristic? Yeah, I don't know. We did not look at it. Yeah, it would also be a nice, uh, interesting area for, for further research to look at approximation algorithms. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm.
All right. Any other question? If not, so let me thanks one more to Sigrid. Uh, I have no other speaker to announce at the moment because uh, the next talk will be in January. So tentatively, we will start uh, the 18th of January. Uh, so thank you uh, for watching uh, this uh, seminar series. Uh, and I hope to see you in January and we will continue again. Uh, there are many nice names. Uh, uh, and I hope that you will be interested to, to listen to them. If not, uh, then you can have all this opportunity to, 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 to watch it on YouTube. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, have thank a nice you. Uh, thank Christmas. You we don't see each other right. and uh, hope to see you in January. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.